So I'm a forgetful person. I'm always losing things like my hat, keys, phone, wallet, and pretty much anything else that I'd like to take out of the house. I've even lost something by it falling off of something else, normally like my children's blanket off of the pram. But even in my dumbest event of closing the house door from the outside, only to realise I don't have my keys or phone, I can proudly say that I haven't lost any radioactive sources. Well, not yet, anyway. I'm still, well, kind of young. One such company that can't say this is Rio Tinto, the organisation that would lose a cesium-137 source in January 2023. Today we're looking at quite a recent radioactive involved incident, rather aptly named the Western Australian Radioactive Capsule Incident. My name's John and you are watching an episode of Plainly Difficult. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my YouTube, Patreon and Ko-fi members. If you want early access to the channel's videos, then you can from just £1 per month. And as always, the links will be in that important pinned comment below. So, this week's video subject is actually a very, very recent, like just over two years ago recent, and it just boggles the mind how such an event could occur, but that's what this video is about to dive into. Background. This is Rio Tinto's Gardai Dari Iron Ore Mine in Western Australia, near the smallest town of Newman, which is around here on my lovely Australian map. And our story begins here with the opening of a new mine in June 2022. It is an open pit mine interested in the digging up of iron ore. Work on the site began around 2018, requiring a 2.6 billion Australian dollar investment. Now, it might not sound like it, but Rio Tinto is actually a British Australian multinational company. Although the name actually comes from the company's early operations around the Rio Tinto in Spain. Anyways, the site makes use of all sorts of different types of equipment in the search for and exploitation of the mine area. One such involved a spicy item similar in size to a paracetamol tablet. But regardless of the manufacturer, it follows the same principle as we've seen many times before for industrial radiography equipment on this channel. It uses a 20 gigabit QL, sometimes reported as 19 gigabit QL, cesium-137 ceramic source, measuring just 6 millimeters wide and 8 millimeters long. I mean, it is very, very tiny. The gauge was, as said by Rio Tinto, was being used in the crushing circuit of the fixed plant. This is the part of the ore process that reduces the feed material to a more manageable size. The source was part of the monitoring system for the feed into the crushing system. It works like this. So material is moved along a conveyor belt and gamma radiation offers a very accurate way of measuring the density of material passed along the conveyor belt. The source and its shielding are placed on one side of the belt. To control the beam of the radiation, there is also a shutter provided. Now, the other side, there is a radiation detector. The greater density of the material on the conveyor would absorb more radiation, thus not being picked up as much by the detector. And conversely, if the material is not so dense, more radiation would pass through and again thusly be picked up in greater amounts by the detector. I hope that kind of made sense and I explained that correctly. Now, we have got that out of the way. We can now move on to the next section of the video, where one such detector would require servicing over 800 miles away from the mine. Where did it go? Like all good things in life, eventually you have to take a break and service your radiation emitting machinery. It was decided to send the gauge off for maintenance and on around January the 10th, 2023, it was prepared for shipping. Packaging for transport was contracted out to the company called SGS Australia, who would then hand off the source in its safe containment to a company for transport called Centurion for its transit to Perth, where SGS would unpack ready for maintenance. The transport crate and pallet were supplied by SGS and transport via road train was all that Centurion was responsible for. The gauge was placed inside a wooden crate with its cesium-137 source inside. It was bolted via four bolts to the crate. 
the road train departed the mine site between the 11th and 14th of January, en route for its some 1300 kilometer, roughly 14 hour non-stop journey to its destination just outside Perth. The crate arrived in the Perth suburb of Malaga, where it was to be serviced. However, it would sit in the licensed service provider's secure radiation storage until the 25th, where it was discovered that there was no source inside the gauge or its crate. One of the bolts, of which there were four, was holding down the gauge was found to be loose, and most of the screws holding the gauge together were also loose, as if it had shaken itself to pieces. This was definitely not good. As soon as it was realised that the source was not on site, the incident and the cesium 137 source's missing status were reported to the Department of Fire and Emergency Services. The search. Initially, search operations began around the Malaga area and around the Rio Tinto mine area back up north. This took place on the 26th of January. But by the 27th, it was apparent that the wider public had to be told, as because such an innocuous looking small piece of material quite possibly could be picked up by someone unsuspecting. The source emitted an equivalent of around 10 x-rays per hour. The official message released to the public was to stay away, as quoted in a BBC report. It emits both beta rays and gamma rays, so if you have it close to you, you could end up with skin burns, the state chief's health officer Andy Robinson warned. Officially, the public was told to stay at least 5 metres or 16.5 feet away if they came across the source. After a false alert from a member of the public with her own Geiger counter proved to be unsuccessful, the search was widened along the GPS route that the land train had taken. This was a massive section of the highway. On the 29th of January, additional resources were requested from Australia's federal government. Quite literally, they were searching for a needle in a haystack, except the haystack was hundreds of miles of inhospitable Australian countryside and the needle was a spicy pill. Officials were concerned that the source may have become embedded in a vehicle tyre, which could have resulted in it being transported to pretty much anywhere. Responders searched the busy areas with handheld radiation detective devices and metal detectors. So from the 29th of January, a vehicle was loaded with a modified Chorus 360 radiation detection unit and driven along the Great Northern Highway. I say a vehicle, but it actually was three vehicles that were converted. The speed of the vehicles was set at around 70 kilometers an hour, which is about 40 miles an hour. Because the exposed source was a gamma and beta emitter, there was a likelihood that the detection unit could find the source's rough location as long as it was within 20 metres of the detector. Over 100 people took part in the search, and at an area just south of Newman, and relatively close to the Rio Tinto site, at just 74 kilometres away from Newman, which was roughly 200 kilometres away from the mine, a spike of 662 keV of gamma radiation was discovered on the 1st of February. An exclusion zone was established around the spike area the centre of which was located around 2 metres from the side of the road, an area unlikely to be picked up by any passerby. Now, the location was found. All that was left was the recovery. The Chorus 360 device was redeployed to pinpoint the exact location, in addition to other handheld radiation detectors. Once pinpointed, the serial code etched onto the side of the source was cross-referenced to the missing one, and bingo, it was a match. I mean, that would be a massive convenience if they found another completely unrelated source, right? The source would be recovered shortly after and then sent via secure transport back to Perth. The source was inspected and it was deemed to be fully intact, thus not having a risk of contaminating its resting spot alongside the highway, which was clearly a good thing. But what of the aftermath? Rio Tinto offered to pay for the recovery costs, but instead ended up donating $4 million worth of mobile camp equipment to assist in a flood recovery incident at Fitzroy Crossing. The company almost straight away apologised for the inconvenience it caused with losing its radiation source. An inquiry would conclude that Rio Tinto wasn't at fault for the missing source, saying in a letter. During its considerations, the council noted Rio Tinto readily and promptly cooperated with the provision of access and information both during the search and throughout the council's inquiry investigations. Further saying, 
The inquiry did not identify any breaches of the Radiation Safety Act by Rio Tinto or its licensees or employees, and no adverse findings against Rio Tinto or its licensees have been recorded. Well, interestingly, even if it had been found in breach, it would only have been on the hook for a 1000 Australian dollar fine. Yes, you heard me. Losing a source from negligence would only result in a relatively small amount of money in penalty. Of course, in the aftermath, the Radiation Safety Act would be reviewed to bringing in greater penalties. And on top of that, the particular gauge was banned from sale in Australia. But what caused the source to escape? It was thought that vibrations from the road train had worked the bolt loose and the gauge screws had then become unwound themselves, allowing the source to just fall out of the gauge into the crate and then out onto the road. Luckily no one was injured in the event and no one died, so let's smash that no one died button. So that's my video on the lost source in Western Australia. It's going to be a one on my scale and this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a plain difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Like licensed. Plain different videos produced by me, John, in a currently very warm corner of Southern London, UK. And all I have to say is thank you very much for watching. And Mr. Music, can you play us out, please? <laughs>